Welcome to the Circular Economy Show by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. In today's episode, we'll be hearing about the recently launched Latin America and Caribbean Circular Economy Coalition, and we'll be hearing from representatives of two countries who are developing circular economy strategies. Moreover, we'll be hearing how this is increasingly a post-COVID recovery, climate resilience, and better growth story. So let's go. Yes, this is the Circular Economy Show, your source for the latest circular economy news and insight. My name is Seb. I'll be your host for this session. I'm part of the team here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the bigger idea of the circular economy, engage key actors in the system and mobilise solutions at scale. Um, and we also want to hear what you think. So do chip in on those comment sections on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you're listening or watching uh, this episode and let us know what you think about what our speakers are saying. Um, so today I'm going to be joined by a range of fantastic speakers. We've got people from the U United UN Environment Programme, the Ministry of Environment and Energy in Costa Rica, uh, the Climate Technology Centre Network, the UN's Climate Technology Centre Network, and of course the Foundation's very own Latin American team. And I'll say a little bit more about each of them as we go. So I want to get started with Luisa Santiago from the Foundation's team in Latin America. Luisa, you've been with us, working with us for five years or so, but what does Latin America stand to gain? What's the region stand to gain from the circular economy? Thanks for having me, Seb. It's a pleasure to be here with such great panelists. Um, well, indeed, um, Latin America is a very different environment from, you know, the European environment when and when we talk about a circular economy here, starting points are very different from what the foundation used to do before moving to its first market outside of the European continent here. Um, so when I first started working with the foundation in 2015, it's over five years now, uh, an immediate realization I had is that the starting point to talk about circular economy where is very different. So in Europe, basically the resources scarcity was an important aspect, an important trigger to talk about it. Um, here in Latin America and the Caribbean region, it's actually the opposite. We talk about um, a circular economy in the, the most resource abundant regions in the world and the most biodiverse one, um, so it's, but also it is very reliant on the extractive linear models and the extractive industries. And, and hence uh, what happened in the, in the last centuries uh, is that the region didn't really sustain um, economic growth. It didn't add much value to the region's um, uh, natural resources. And it, it also didn't um, successfully distribute the wealth uh, um, in the society. So when we talk about a circular economy here, uh, it is it, it's, it remains an important solutions framework to some of the biggest challenges of our times, like climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, waste and pollution. Um, it, it still needs to have a design approach, one that concentrates effort in the upstream solution and, and based on the same principles of eliminating waste and pollution, of keeping materials and products in use and regenerating natural systems. Um, but I think, what really adds value to the Latin American and Caribbean continent is about creating and adding, adding value, uh, regenerative value to its abundant natural resources. It is about the, the very important and core aspect of a circular economy, which is to create a resilient and distributed and diverse and inclusive economy that will create prosperity to all in the long term. Uh, and, and just to finish on that, uh, with the pandemic having hit the region more severely than any other region in in the world, both in health as well as in economic terms, it is more relevant than ever to deliver better growth to a region that has grown regardless of the impact of this extraction of resources and uh, and and being and now to really deliver uh, long term prosperity uh, and and to a region that is very exposed to vulnerable and vulnerable to shocks in the global supply chains as the region is. So a lot of our viewers will be very familiar with 
the European version of the circular economy. Our regular viewers be very familiar with the European version of a circular economy story, a, a continent really dependent on imports, and therefore there's a very competitive advantage from um, de deprioritizing our dependence on that, and we're very aware of resource fight finiteness. What you're telling us is a quite a different story in a sense. It's almost about um, there's, uh, the other negative impact of the linear economy is the extractiveness of it, the fact that it's depleting your resources, depleting what makes the region so valuable and rich. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a completely different twist on that in the Latin American context. And what you talked about there a little bit is this sort of journey of understanding there's a different starting point. What's really changed during the, your time working with the foundation in Latin America? Yeah, I'll tell that in a minute. Just uh, there is a, a name to what you just said. Uh, we call it the resource curse. Latin America has always, since the colonization times, depend on extracting and exporting its resources, had, having added very very little value to it, and hence intelligence and uh, you know skills, jobs, etc., are limited and not not even compared to the, the wealth of resources that we have. So I think circular economy can close that gap and deliver better growth. Um, but just going back to your question, uh, indeed, a lot has changed. So five and a half years of a journey for me. Uh, when I first started, um, the circular economy was very unknown, to be honest. People, many people in businesses, um, policymakers, they didn't even hear about, they haven't even heard about the topic. Uh, and the very few times where it kind of was there, it was very much related to the downstream agenda, the recycling, the waste management agenda. Um, so very often I had to explain from zero what a circular economy was. Um, and that was just five and a half years ago. I mean, of course, people that are, that are very into the, the whole agenda, uh, you know, we're more familiar to it. Although until today, you still hear a lot of, uh, of that connected to the waste and recycling agendas. Um, but what is really interesting to see is that the, the region picked up the topic very quickly. And this, the steep growth of the understanding and the practices of a circular economy in the region were quite incredible. Um, so from nearly zero, to now, what we see is an incredible momentum with policymakers putting, uh, putting out their national roadmaps, national strategies to really re reshape the entire economy of countries like Colombia, like um, Chile, like Costa Rica and others. And, and so what you're describing there, Luisa, is this sort of unstoppable momentum almost in, in the region. And that seems like a really good time to bring in Ad, my second guest, Adriana, who, is, who works for the UN Environment Programme in Latin America. Now, Adriana, Luisa described anecdotally to me, described, said that this coalition that I spoke about just being launched in my introduction would not have happened without you. So uh, could you tell us just briefly, what is the Latin American Caribbean Circomi Coalition and how did it come about? Thanks. Well, first, let me thank you for the invitation to this show. Very happy to be here. And yeah, and so as Luisa said, the, by the end of 2019, there was a 18, 19, there was a growing interest by countries, private sector, academia, on circular economy, and we saw more and more initiatives, policies, and at the same time, also we as international organizations were increasing our offer. And I remember very well uh, the day I was talking actually with my colleagues that I'm sharing the panel today. I was talking to Nicole from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, and she was telling me on the study they were doing on mapping circular economy policies. That same day, I talked to Luisa, and she's telling me about other study that they wanted to, to start, and it was so much interlinked. And that same week, UNIDO was organizing a, 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 the circular economy forum for the Southern Corn, and I said, oh God, we are doing too much, <laughs> too many things, we are duplicating, I say, and this is when this idea of the coalition came and I say, we need to do a coalition, we need to join forces. And that's how I started to contact each of the partners. So CTCN, for example, we were already working with them in some of the countries they are supporting. Um, then the IDB was supporting the uh, Alliance, the Pacific Alliance on Plastics, Helen MacArthur, as I mentioned, then we brought the the Nauer, PACE, uh, UNIDO, and the World Economic Forum. 
I was very happy to see really that all these eight institutions were keen in cooperating. Nobody was like defending the agenda or saying no. So on the contrary, we say it makes sense really to bring together all our resources, our expertise in avoiding duplications and really making a bigger impact and offer to the countries a more coherent uh, policy support. And so to make the story short, we all came together and make a concept note uh, for the coalition that was presented at the regional forum of ministers of environment here in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we brought this proposal like, what about if we create this regional coalition on circular economy? And I was very happy to see that countries say, yes, the first thing is, yes, we need a platform where we can exchange knowledge among countries in the region and maybe the ones like Chile, Colombia, Ecuador that had already their strategies can share that with other countries. The second uh, request was we need to have an own vision. What is circular economy in Latin America? As Luisa said, no, it's one, the region with the mega biodiversity. Are we using that? I mean, a, country, a region with an extractive economy. So what does it mean? What are our opportunities, challenges? And the third message one was really interesting and coming from the Caribbean was circular economy has to look at the region and not only national territories, because at the end of the day for countries in particular in the Caribbean, that also has implications of cooperation, trade, etc. So here is when the countries gave us a green light and say, yes, do that. And, and then during 2020 last year, we were really coming together in doing the TORs and the last thing, just to say, bring in champion countries because we want this coalition to be driven by countries and responding to their priorities. So then is when we were very happy to have now in the string committee, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic and Peru. And we will hear from a couple of those uh, examples during the course of this episode uh, in Colombia and Costa Rica. And it's interesting what you described there, Adriana, this sort of coalition of NGOs identifying that there's lots of different activities going on. How do we do one thing? And I think that topic of collaboration, of a, of a united vision, of a convergence of factors will be something we probably come back to on a few occasions during, um, during the show. And I know that actually you joined us for the summit, uh, our, the Ellen McCarthy Foundation summit uh, um, at the end of last year in September 2020. And you're talking about that over 20 of the countries in the region have at least one circular economy initiative um, launched. So there's a huge amount of activity and it, and it feels like the coalition's goal is how do we bring some of that together and, uh, and push forward together. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about some of that activity and we've got a video clip now um, with Nicole Stopfer from the um, Comrad and Danauer Foundation. I've probably not said that completely right. So we've got, um, we've got a clip here from Nicole where she's, she's talking about a study they published in November 2019 about circular economy policies and activities in Latin America. And she talks about the key findings of the study and the work of the coalition. So let's take a listen to this. Circular economy has gained a lot of attention in Latin America over the last couple of years as an effective instrument to actively push sustainable development. With this in mind, the regional program ECLACAS, in cooperation with the Centro de Innovación y Economía Circular, carried out a study in 2019 with the goal to show how far advanced Latin America actually has been, and most of all, what public policies exist on circular economy. There are some quite a few main findings, but I will stick to three. First of all, we were able to identify more than 80 public policy initiatives in the region, and various countries such as Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile are either working on national plans or have implemented roadmaps on circular economy. At the same time, the majority of these initiatives focused mainly on residuals and waste management. At the same time though, it was thrilling to see that there has been quite a surge in entrepreneurship and private sector initiatives, and both local and national governments have started to support these through co-finance and subsidies. What does this mean for circular economy in Latin America? There's a great potential for public policies because there's a big momentum and interest, and at the same time, there's a need to push education in the field of circular economy both on individual and corporate, but also on governmental and multilateral level. And there's still a long way to go for the region to actually become circular. And with the Regional Coalition on Circular Economy, we as CAS, along with our strategic partners and lead countries, are hoping to be able to contribute so Latin America can advance towards becoming a circular region. Last but not least, 
the study that we did in 2019 went into a second round last year, and we were able to update some information and most of all, see a significant increase in initiatives. In 2020, we counted a total of over 180 initiatives. This shows not, also, not just the momentum, but also the need for regional cooperation. So that was Nicole from the Cass Foundation. Several interesting things to pick up on there. I particularly found it interesting she was talking about where some of the focus is starting. And very often we see this with circular economy that there can be a slightly narrow kind of waste management focus. It evolves very quickly into this bigger idea. And she was talking about some of the entrepreneurship stuff going on um, in some of the activities that they mapped. And that brings us on perhaps nicely to um, Rose from the UN's Climate Technology Center Network, which I'm going to from now on refer to as CTCN for my own sake. Uh, welcome, Rose. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Rose, just very quickly first, what is C CTCN? What does CTCN do? Um, thank you very much. Um, the CTCN, or the Climate Technology Center and Network, is actually a mechanism of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, that specifically was set in place by member states uh, to facilitate the transfer of environmentally sound technologies from developed countries to developing countries. And in establishing um, the CTCN, um, the member states also established um, national focal points in 161 countries to facilitate that technology transfer. Now, um, we are a center, uh, which I run, but we are also a facilitator of a network now of around over 600 entities, the majority of them private sector companies. And therein, I think, lies the strength of what we do because it is this network of partners that delivers the technologies to the developing countries. And so being a partnership-based institution, we really saw a great value in joining the Luck Coalition on Circular Economy because we know the power of synergy and partnerships private sector NGOs working with governments and the UN entities. So right now for the CTCM, uh, we're based in Copenhagen in the UN city. We are hosted by the government of Denmark, uh, but we have regional offices in the LAC region um, hosted by UNEP. And we have one um, in uh, the Asia Pacific region as well in Bangkok that is also hosted by UNEP and in Nairobi. And the reason we are hosted by UNEP um, is because UNEP has an agreement with the UNFCCC to host all the operational activities of its technology framework. And this has worked out extremely very well. We are now operational in over 100 countries and we have facilitated over 280 technology transfers, uh, many of those relate to circularity actions in various sectors in these countries. Um, so that is a little bit about um, the Climate Technology Centre network. And, um, and CTCN has been involved in supporting at least 11 different countries on their circular economy roadmaps. Can you tell us a bit about that process and any of the key outcomes and findings from that work? Yeah, so the CTCN, as I said, was established by the member states that make up the UNFCCC. And so starting 2018, it was very interesting for us to see um, countries in the Latin American region coming to us requesting for support on the circular, on their circular economy. And so by 2019, we had finalized the initial discussions with the first four or five countries to start supporting them. And what really countries wanted was a, a comprehensive approach. So they say, we want to start off with a roadmap to really understand what a future of circularity would look like in our countries. Where are the options? What are the obstacles and challenges we currently face and how could we possibly deal with them? What kind of partnerships um, should we have for both public and private sector to enhance our circularity work? And of course, most importantly, for the work we do at the CTCM, what kind of technologies would we need uh, to build a very successful and effective circular industry across all sectors in the Latin American region? And I think my colleagues have mentioned something extremely important. Uh, Latin America is extremely resource rich and the level of extraction is intense. 
a lot of this um, extraction has remained exactly at that level with varying degrees of um, industrialization and production in countries, but largely the volume of wealth and extraction in the continent is not reflected at all in the level of industrialization. And so one of the things we are learning as we work with the countries and developing their circular economies is how to literally leapfrog, as it were, go into industrialization best off of the rich resource um, availability into a, a systems production that is circular. I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, but there is a challenge for the current industrialization levels of um, repurposing a lot of those industries to become circular because they were really designed on a linear process that is not circular. It's costly. Um, it takes a degree of innovation um, because with the, even with the technological transfer that we facilitate, a, a lot of national level innovation needs to go into purposing those technologies to serve the needs of these countries and the resources they have. And really, there hasn't been a lot of investment either in the private sector, in these industries, or in government uh, for a long time into the level of innovation that would enable a seamless transition to circularity. So there's a lot of investment that needs to go that into that, both financing, uh, but also just in the level of um, technical expertise. Uh, it's not just for technology or industry, but also for policy. The kind of tax incentives, for example, that would enable the industry to repurpose or leapfrog into circularity. It's, uh, it's funny, when you first explain CTA, CTCN, it kind of seems simple. You're almost, you're almost a technolo technology broker in some ways, aren't you? Your demands for technology matching with what you know the market and also you know, validating some providers and helping companies solve um, challenges they have. But in what you were just saying, you've, you've talked about finance, the importance of upfront investment to shift these industries. You've talked about just understanding some of the technologies and technical needs and then, and then other enabling factors, including policy. Do you, do you find that your work in the region with this coalition, that you've, in, you've increasingly developed a point of view, a sort of direction that you're advising countries and partners on? Or is it more responding to just the demand of the region that these countries are really asking for circular economy solutions? It is a partnership because we are demand driven. We definitely responded to our request for support initially from the countries. But as we've gone along on this journey, we've developed a partnership that has allowed us to think together with the member states to bring um, the partnerships and the expertise that are required to support them and to really create with them the kind of systems and processes and policies and regulatory frameworks that they would need to achieve the vision of circularity. Describing technology as an enabler, it's something that can help you to achieve what you want to achieve and to be, and you need to have a vision to, to understand that. And it almost feels a good time to bring you back in, Louisa, um, because obviously one of the enabling conditions is policy. The previous episode of this show talked about the universal policy goals, and it feels like we've touched on several of those, you know, design, uh, design to stimulate circular economy, invest, uh, design to, uh, sorry, Policy goals number three, I think it is, invest in circular economy or enable investment in circular economy, collaboration. How does this, how do the policy goals help an effort like this and, and connect in with what's happening in the region of Latin America? Yeah, you're right. I mean, the uh, the five policy goals that we discussed that was that were discussed in the last episode are crucial and they feed very nicely into the work that the coalition needs to do in Latin America in order to really help the region, as Nicole was saying, to advance uh, towards a circular economy because there's still a long way to go. Um, and I think the coalition for me is a great concrete example of goal five in action, which is collaboration for systems change. Uh, the as the coalition will become the main platform for interministerial, intersectoral, intercountries collaboration um, to build a circular economy in the region. Um, it is, you know, the of ultimate importance that a common vision for the region is built. So. Uh, the entire discussion around the coalition can be um, uh, fed 
by the whole idea of the policy goals. As, as Rose was saying, there is a need to change a lot in policies, subsidies, tax incentives. They need to be aligned to that common vision. And uh, Adriana mentioned in the beginning that um, the countries are, are really uh, anxious to have a common vision for the region. Um, and we at the Alamacat Foundation, our team in Latin America, supported by the team in the UK, will be working together with the other partners of the coalition and member countries uh, in the next few months to develop this regional vision that will give a go common direction of travel to all the stakeholders, albeit understanding the different approaches that they will have, what you know, the role that policymakers have is different from the role of businesses uh, and, and the entrepreneurs in general, um, and, and academics and designers have their, you know, to, to absorb that new skills and have their own role in that um, transition. Uh, so what we really want to explore and, and, and tailor to the region is what is this vision? What is this exciting vision that the region wants to look at in order to uh, concentrate or concertate efforts um, in the different groups of stakeholders to really create and collaborate for systems change? We really need to look at a new era of development, a new wave of development that will create sustained growth, adding value and regenerative value uh, to the natural resources that will distribute wealth and be much better to the entire society um, and will make Latin America a, a very uh, prosper continent because of its wealth, uh, natural wealth, the biodiversity itself as a core aspect of creating economic value and the, um, uh, the distribution of wealth, creating really, um, uh, or reducing vulnerabilities of so many parts of the society. And when I come back to the story you told us at the beginning, you know, the, the sort of pace of change that's happened in the region just in your time of working on circular economy, you know, it feels like we talk about circular economy as a solutions framework. It can scale very fast. And I think that when I just listen to this conversation, because it can be built around a simple set of principles, you know, designed to eliminate waste and pollution, designed to keep products and materials in use, designed to regenerate natural systems, or five universal policy goals. And then it can be contextualized in whatever context it needs to exist in. And I guess in the case of yeah. the coalition, it's several, it's whatever an X number of countries that are, that are, that are part of that. Um, so that, that pace of change that we've talked about so far feels like it's only set to continue. Yes, that's, that's the feeling and the hope that we have. Um, so just coming back to you, Adriana, I think uh, the other kind of macro question that might be good to touch on is how is this going to connect? How does this connect in with the global agenda? Obviously, you're representing the, the UNEP here. Um, is this part of something bigger? Yes, definitely. I think, uh, as as Luisa say, no, we we want to we have we want to have a systemic change, a new paradigm. And in this, I think the coalition will will address the global challenges, but bring in regional solutions. So how how do we respond? For example, let's see now in our context with the pandemic, uh, how can circular economy contribute to the green recovery? Uh, and I want to say something really beautiful. Last week, uh, the, the minister of, of the Prime Minister of Barbados was saying, we don't need to build back better. We need to build forward better. And this is the thing, we, want, we don't want to go back. We want to see a new development, just uh, as Luisa was saying. So here is, can we then provide really science-based knowledge to the countries to say these are the economic, environmental, social gains that you will have if you integrate the circular economy in your stimulus package. Um, and this is the type of investment. We know by some assessment, for example, from the International Labor Organization, Latin America and the Caribbean could generate 4.8 million jobs if we embrace circular economy. So how do we make this happen? So I think that's the first contribution that we need to size in the region and support countries in that. The second one, climate change. Yes, we talk about global things and, and national um, strategies, but as a region, how can also we join forces so that really as some of the reports from Helen MacArthur is saying, no, if, if circular economy and if we change the way we are producing products and, and food, 
if with that we can address 45% of the greenhouse emissions, so how can we provide more technological support as CTCN is doing, or the knowledge, the indicators, the support to industry? And then the other one, biodiversity, definitely. This year we have the COP for climate change for biodiversity. So some studies that we have done with the International Resource Panel are indicating that in some sectors, just by embracing the principles of um, circular economy, let's say re, um, remanufacturing, repairing, etc., we could reduce, imagine this, 80 to 99% destruction of natural resources. Can we imagine the benefits for, for biodiversity? It's this convergence of factors, you know, how do we solve biodiversity, how do we solve climate change, how do we solve economic recovery? This is the systemic model that we're talking about that can tackle those things. And interest, just one, one last question for you, Adriana, I guess, because just picking up on that stat you had, 4.8 million jobs, that might surprise some people because they would assume that actually not re extracting as many resources might have a negative impact on jobs because the region is is currently a, a big resource extractor. But what you're saying is actually has huge social benefits in terms of job creation. Absolutely, yes. And and that's about if we bring the innovation in the production systems. No? For example, imagine if we have more shops for repairing products. So you generate jobs. If we start doing different, um, what the industrial symbiosis, a different way of, um, yeah, producing food, for example. Sometimes the, the main problem with food is the labor intensive for organic food, for example. So there's an opportunities to generate jobs. So yeah, there's a, a great potential in that. Great. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you so much, Louisa and Rose, for joining me. Next up. In our episode, we're going to hear a short video clip from Carlos Carrera, who's the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia and also president of the coalition. So let's hear what he has to say. Dicha coalición se creó con el objetivo principal de crear una visión y una perspectiva regional común con un enfoque integrado y holístico, así como ser una plataforma para compartir conocimiento y herramientas para apoyar la transición hacia la economía circular con un enfoque de pensamiento de ciclo de vida. Para el 2030 tenemos como visión que los países de América Latina y el Caribe han comenzado a transitar de una economía lineal a un modelo de economía circular, desvinculando el crecimiento económico de la degradación ambiental y el uso de recursos mientras al mismo tiempo que se mejora el bienestar humano. La regeneración de los ecosistemas y la prosperidad contribuye así al cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 y a los Acuerdos de París. That was Carlos Carrera, the Minister for Environment and Sustainable Development uh, of Colombia and President of the Latin America and Caribbean Circular Economy Coalition. I'm now very pleased to be joined by the Vice Minister for Energy and Environment from Costa Rica, Rolando Castro. Thank you so much, Rolando, for joining us. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the context of Costa Rica and circular economy. Obviously, the country has a national decarbonization plan. What is that and how does circular economy play in? Yeah, thanks so much for having me in this program. And yes, uh, Costa Rica launched his decarbonization plan in February 2019. And it's a very ambitious plan to decarbonize our economy by 2050. Even though Costa Rica has done important achievements in terms of um, electricity, for instance, we have a, a electricity matrix that is based on renewable energy, almost 100%. And also we were able to stop um, deforestation. We also have a lot of challenges in terms of uh, contributions to the uh, CO2 emissions. For instance, transportation, industry, agriculture, agri agriculture um, land development, construction, and so on. So the dec decarbonization plan sets goals for all these important topics 
And uh, we are trying to do uh, measures in the short term, in the middle term, and in the long term in order to decarbonize our economy. And for this circular economy, it's a very important approach for the country in order to use the resources wisely to um, reduce um, waste and also to uh, reactivate our economy in a post-COVID era, but do it in a green way, in a sustainable way. And I think this is how decarbonization and circular economy are um, two uh, feet in order to walk this important path of the decarbonization and reactivation. And um, it's interesting because obviously, yes, the context of Costa Rica is that you, I think you have, you're, it's, it's true that you're nearly 100%, your electricity is nearly 100% powered or 100% powered by renewable energy. And for many people, when they think about climate goals and climate change, energy is the picture, right? It's, it's well, okay, mm -hmm. so you've 100% renewables, great, you're, you're done. And what the ambition of, the, of Costa Rica says is actually that's just part of the way, that's part of the story. There's also this industry picture and that's where circular economy plays in. Exactly. Now we have that competitive advantage, I would say, of having this electric matrix uh, that is clean, and then we can do is we can impact other areas of the economy, such as transportation. We can electrify our transportation because we import the fossil fuels and we have clean energy that is produced in Costa Rica. So we can um, also impact positively our economy and also we can uh, electrify our industry. So we, that would reduce the, uh, the CO2 emissions, but also it will reduce the cost of this industry. So we are aiming for a green reactivation of the economy in a post-COVID era. And it also feels like it's a place where there's a sort of convergence of factors. I know that in addition to the National Decarbonisation Plan, there's a, there's a sustainable production and consumption agenda within Costa Rica. There's obviously um, obligations to the Paris agreements on climate change. So climate change, biodiversity, economic recovery, feels like circular economy as an idea sits across these different mm -hmm. agendas within um, Costa Rica's policy frameworks. Exactly, and I think it makes a lot of sense for us because uh, now everybody wants to reactivate the economy, everybody wants to create more jobs, and uh, there are many important um, sectors of our economy that were uh, damaged by this COVID, uh, such as the tourism industry. So I think circular economy, it's a very good approach to not only achieve our goals, such as the ones you mentioned, but also in order to um, uh, offer an alternative for these sectors in order to um, get back to business, but in a, in a green manner. In a, in a sustainable matter. And I think that way circular economy is key because it also um, means saving a lot of money in energy efficiency, in, in reducing waste management, in you know, uh, reducing cost. And that makes a lot of sense for many sectors in the economy. So this is an economics driven agenda that has other benefits. Um, I guess the what we've talked about so far a little bit is some of the positive momentum in Costa Rica. The obvious question in the context of what we're talking about today is then why, what's the value of collaborating? What, what's, why get involved in the Latin American Caribbean coalition? Well, it is important for small economies such as ours, but also I think Latin America and the Caribbean are um, large producers of um, natural resources. Our economies are based on natural resources exploitation. So I think it makes a lot of sense for us uh, in order to be more efficient and more competitive to use uh, an approach like circular economy in order to get to markets such as the European Union uh, in order to um, be more uh, attractive and reach you know, more informed 
um, customers, and that will make a difference for our economies. Also, we can create um, um, an area that can uh, access those markets. But also, I think it's important for our countries to be part of this coalition in order to share experiences, best practices, you know, not so good uh, practices also that were used and probably uh, you can avoid other countries to, to, to make the same mistakes and also attract investments, uh, also the multi multilateral uh, finance institutions can also uh, support this coalition and these initiatives in order to grant better markets for our products. And my final question, Rolando, is we've talked about it, we've talked about the positive momentum, the coalition. What's the biggest barrier or challenge for a country like Costa Rica in implementing the circular economy? Well, I think um, sometimes um, when you do want to do reactivation, there is always um, some people that want to do, you know, the quick and dirty approach. Uh, because reactivation of the economy it's, it's, uh, is now the most important issue for our economy. So the quick and dirty approach, the business as usual approach is always on the agenda, but at the end of the day, that will probably cost us more than going the, for the green and sustainable path. And in that way, circular economy it's, it's, it's sustainable, it's clean, but also it's an economically intelligent way to, to, to reactivate the economy. Rolando Castro, thank you so much for joining the Circle Economy Show. Um, thank you for spending some time with us. Thank um, you. That, that's it for this episode of the Circle Economy Show. So we've heard there from the Vice Minister of Energy and Environment in Costa Rica the practical experience of trying to implement this at a government policy level. And we've heard throughout this conversation this sort of convergence of factors. The circle is a bigger idea to really tackle some really big meaty issues in a region as large and as varied as Latin America. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We've really enjoyed having you um, along and do continue to comment in the various spaces on YouTube, Facebook and LinkedIn with your thoughts and your views um, on this episode. We'll be back here every two weeks at the same time and place, so 3 p.m. UK time on Tuesdays. Um, if you want to find out what's coming up on the series, do check out the Ellen McCarthy Foundation's website and search for Circle Economy Show. Or even better, subscribe to um, our YouTube, our LinkedIn, our Facebook channels to get notified every single time we go live. And if you really want to do us a favor, click that like button and share this video. That's all for this time on the Circle Economy Show. We'll see you next time.